Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast. A weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Rollin'. Rollin'. Freedom Fiends. Hello, Freedom do? Fiends. Yeah, I was just thinking about LibPair, Michael. Why? Because uh, I was out of the water from the Brita filter, you know, so I had to get tap water, and it's just, it's not good. Like, I think in LibPair... You'd have competition, so I could I could pay you know an extra fifty bucks a month or whatever for water that didn't taste like chemicals and stink like crap and have uh, fluoride in it. Yeah, and have fluoride in it. Yeah. Um, I I live in a place called the Tri Cities, so it's it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, we're all sorted together, but uh, each city has its own different government. And I I'm unlucky enough to live in the only one of the Tri Cities that fluoridates its water. Ugh. So we've had a good week, man. Uh, we broke our record for most downloads. We had an 11 gig gigabyte download day. Nice. That is awesome. And our Alexa ranking is the lowest ever. It's 4.1 million. It's down from like 5.8 million a couple months ago. That's really impressive. I mean, to me, that makes me feel really good. I really appreciate all the support from all the fiends out there. And uh, I can't wait till it gets under 3 million and then, you know, under 2 and then under 1. I know. Well, you know, it probably is. And here's what I heard. I was reading the Wikipedia article on Alexa. And one of the criticisms of it is that it often under-reports, basically because it only reports on people who have the Alexa toolbar installed. Alexa's owned by Amazon, by the way. And um, ah, the okay. toolbar ships with a lot of computers and stuff and other software. You can disable it, and then you can also add it on from the web if you want. But it's like a lot of people who are into privacy probably wouldn't want that on there, and I would think that'd be a good percentage of our listenership. Right, right. So it's about as accurate as, say, the Nielsen ratings. It's just a sample <laughs> of everybody on the web. Yeah, but think of the Nielsen ratings. You know, think about a phone survey about privacy. You probably wouldn't get... You know, you'd probably say, oh, 60% of Americans don't care about their privacy because, you know, it'd be skewed by the fact that the people who would answer a survey don't care about privacy and people who are into privacy would hang up or probably not even have a phone, you know? That's a, so they'd be underrepresented. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, yeah, a, a poll is only uh, information on those who are inclined to take a poll and inclined to waste that time on the phone. Yeah. I mean, I remember... At one point, some moderators on Wikipedia tried to remove the Boston Tea Party article saying it wasn't notable because they looked on the internet and there wasn't much about him. And then somebody went on there and defended it and kept it on by saying, this is a guy who writes books on how to keep your information off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Why would he want himself to be on the internet? And I, I don't know. I mean, that's his thing. And so... Um, it kind of does annoy me, though. I mean, I don't want to throw a shot at him or anything, but I do wish I could see and read more Boston Tea Party stuff on the web. Well, there are a couple videos of him at a couple years ago at Free State New Hampshire Forum, the Pride right. Fest. Right, if right. You wanna, if you want to see what he looks like or hear him talk, those you know, search him on uh, YouTube. There's, there's one of him giving us a, a talk in a room full of people, and then there's another one where two girls interviewed him after. He's okay. wearing a suit. He looks really uh, prestigious. I don't know. Sometimes the way I feel about Liberty Media, though, is like I'm hungry for the latest. Like if a thing's a week old, because so much stuff comes out these days. It's I think we do live in a really blessed time with the internet and with people waking up. You know, I can be pickier about my Liberty Media, and I want I want it to be now. I want it to be stuff that's talking about recent world events, just because the world changes so fast and everybody knows everything about it like seconds after it yeah. happens. And you and I kind of go back and forth with choosing what to use. It's getting to the point where we have so many notes of current stuff combined with stuff we want to talk about each week that we're having to pick and choose. And we may start doing two podcasts a week. We talked about that. One thing we need to do is get some donations or some income coming in so we can get 
a virtual private server which will handle spikes better. We're starting to get some big spikes of uh, a bunch of people looking all at once. And, you know, if we get the Colbert bump or, or the dig.com bump or something, which we probably will eventually, you know, we don't want to get knocked offline. We want to have a server <laughs> that can do it. And that's going to be like 50 bucks a month extra. So if anyone wants to buy our movie, which is available on Amazon. I'm out of copies myself. I sold sold them all out. I have one left, but that'll be sold by the time you all hear this, I'm sure. And uh, you can buy it on Amazon, Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom. And even if you don't want to buy it, you can support it by going and reviewing it if you've seen it. We've got four reviews right now, so that's great. They're, they're really awesome reviews, too. We'd like to see more if you've seen it and you've got some time. All you have to do is have an Amazon account. You don't have to buy the movie or buy anything else on Amazon. And make sure you're reviewing the $15 one, which is the right. director's cut, <laughs> not the $120 one, which is out of print, but it's still listed for sale for some reason. Right. And the cheap Cheaper one is also much better. It's the yeah. director's cut. It's not neutered. Yep, it's not neutered. But um, speaking of new information, you and I listen to like every other Liberty podcast out there during the week. And, you know, some things come up that we go, we need to talk about this. And then we hear 20 other people say the same things about it that we were going to say. And then we just don't bother talking about it. <laughs> I think that's a quality problem for the Liberty movement, though. I mean, it is. It is. I heard two new podcasts this week that blew me away. One is Bad Quaker. It's badquaker.com. Badquaker.com. He calls himself Bad Quaker because he's a Quaker who carries a gun for self-defense, and Quakers right, are supposed right. to curl up in a ball if they're attacked. He's very smooth and patient, too, with the way he makes his points. I feel yeah. like he's, he spends a good amount of time on each subject, but um, he sort of breaks it down to where anybody can understand what he's saying. Yep. He said some things, he dropped some mad science that blew me away. Um, <laughs> one of the things he said, and, and some of it's kind of religious, but in a way that I can wrap my head around, or at least think I could use this as an argument with Christian Shereans or Muslim Shereans or Jewish right. Shereans or right. you know, anybody who thinks they know and the law should reflect it. One of the things he said that I loved was that whenever you sit in judgment of someone, you know, like tell them they shouldn't be able to buy liquor on a Sunday or shouldn't wear a short skirt or shouldn't be able to smoke pot and the government gun should take care of it. Whether you're the state, which does that by definition, or whether you're a nanny stater, you know, someone doing it by horizontal enforcement, yep. you are sitting in judgment of another human. And when you sit in judgment of another human, he says, you are kicking God off the throne and that is original sin. So exactly. there's an argument you can use with your parents when they say pot should be illegal. It's a great argument, and you know, I think Tupac even said it. He said, "Only God can judge me." People say that a lot. Yeah, and I think it rings very true. But putting that in that, that term of like, it's original. It's kicking God off the throne, and that's original sin. That's the lines I'd use when telling someone why they sh when judging someone of why they shouldn't judge people. Exactly. Exactly. He had some other arguments that were amazing too, and he's like fifty-five or sixty, I think. He said, "I'm going to tell you why Ron Paul shouldn't be president." And before you start yelling at me, let me let you know I've been voting for Ron Paul longer than most Ron Paul supporters have been alive. You right. know, I first voted for Ron Paul twenty-three years ago, but if Ron Paul becomes president, he's going to make the government more efficient, and the the only saving grace of the state is how inefficient it is. And if he makes it more efficient and then he's gone, someone else will come in and use that against us. <laughs> See, I thought it was a good point, but the thing that struck me is I think the government's very efficient if you look at it in what it wants to do. I mean, as far as providing you know, a benefit to society, of course it's inefficient as hell. But I don't think that that's the real point of the people in power. It's just to enrich themselves. And yeah, I think they're very good at enriching themselves. I think Ron Paul would put a wrench in yeah. that type of enrichment. They've been really good, for instance, at, you know, throwing young black men in prison. And now, lately, there seems to be this, well, we need to make it more fair, so we're going to throw a lot of white people in prison, too. But. Right, right. Well, that exactly. That, that's the point. They're, they're very good at throwing people in jail. They're very good at murdering people and droning them and spying on us. They're very good at the things they do. And I think Ron Paul's whole thing, I mean, I don't know if he could get it done, uh, but I think his whole goal is to sort of tear some of that down and make government less efficient in those ways. I love him as a philosopher. Right, right. Uh, and I, I think part of the thing that worries me, too, is, you know, he gets in power. And Bad Quaker had a really good point on this. He was worried that... Um, Paul could get assassinated or something. He said he grew up in the 60s and remembers that when you fell out of line and you were a politician, you fell in a pool of blood. I don't really want to go there necessarily because I'm not super well informed on it and I didn't grow up in the 60s. I wasn't even born yet. 
It was a bunch of people in a row. It was Je- it was John Kennedy. It was uh, Bobby Kennedy. It was MLK. It was uh, Malcolm X was killed. How close in a in a time span was it? I mean, was it like one public figure after another that you remember? I mean, a couple of them were. It kind of blends together to me right now. But I think the Kennedys were within a couple of years of each other. I don't remember, man. It was just it was a blur of you know something happened this week that I haven't seen happen since the '60s was. Um, People barricaded the Oakland port, the uh, Occupy Wall Street people did. And the Uh, only time I've remembered protesters barricading a port was in the 60s. And it was like, you know, some port that was delivering military support for our campaign in Vietnam. Hmm. Hmm. I guess that's not super violent because you're trying to prevent other violence. But I think blocking a port, if it's a commercial action, I mean, that's something that governments do. That's like a blockade. You're also screwing the 99%. You're screwing the union workers that work on the docks. You know, they're going exactly. to... Well, you're, you're screwing consumers. You're raising prices. That kind of thing hurts poor people in the middle class the most. I mean, it's just like when we put sanctions on other countries. It doesn't hurt the rich people. It doesn't hurt the 1% in those countries. It hurts the 99%. I mean, it's like the kids who starved in Iraq because of the sanctions. When you block goods from coming into a country, you shut down the way society works. Yep. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. So I hate to I hate to quote other people a lot. You know, you should just go listen to Bad Quaker, but he said another thing that really I like the way he said it was about getting involved in government. He said, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of people a lot of people think there's only two things you can do. Get involved in government and make it work better or attack it violently. And he said that's a false dichotomy and the real thing to do is education and just removing the demand for the so-called products the government provides, which I like and that's what we do. Removing the demand is, is I think, a beautiful way of putting it. And education is the only way to get there is because, like we've said a million times, it's horizontal enforcement that keeps it all in line. It's obedience that really drives tyranny. It's the 99% that enforce the rules of the 1%. Yeah. And the analogy he had, which really is a good one to use on anyone who you think needs to be anarchist, but is still going, but if I don't get involved in politics, other people will, (laughs) and they'll make it worse. If I don't vote, here's his analogy with working within the system. He said, if someone came up to you and stuck a gun in your face and was going to mug you, and you were, you know, "Uh, hang on a sec, I'll get my wallet, and they pulled the trigger to try to kill you because you were (laughs) taking too long, Uh and and the gun jammed and didn't go off, would you say, oh, I see you have a 1911. I'm familiar with the 1911. Here, let me field strip that and fix it for you. And then you do it and hand it back to him so it works. That's making the government more efficient or even being involved with it at all. I think it's being involved with it at all. It's going to to city council meetings. It's being a part of the process and reading the voter pamphlet. It's all helping the mugger. And I think it's genius to use that imagery because the state does have a gun pointed at our head. And it does want our money that we work for hard. So the other podcast that I want to give a shout out to is the Freedom Outlaws podcast. It's freedomoutlaws.podomatic.com. Automatic. <laughs> now, you want to talk about some OGs. I think these guys are in their 60s or 70s. I've seen pictures of one of them. These are like the people that influenced Claire Wolf, okay? Wow. They're wow. that OG, and they sound it. They sound like a loving grandpa explaining liberty to you. Nice. Um, Elias Elias, which is the greatest name I've ever heard. Elias Elias is the founder, one of the founders of the Mental Militia Forum, which I used to be active on and Mama Liberty was on a lot. Okay, okay. um, And she's a moderator there and has her own section there, actually, her own part of the forum, the Mama Liberty part of the forum. Nice. Um, And, you know, Claire Wolf and Elias Elias and a few other people started that site and it's pretty popular. I don't know where they live, somewhere in one of the square states, as we call it, you know, this part of the country. Not one of the square like status, but square like <laughs> it looks like shape. a square. <laughs> but actually, the square the in shape one, the square in shape ones are often the ones with the most freedom, or at least gun freedom, and they are kind of square. You know, I mean, Montana, Wyoming, Utah. You know, they're all a lot of high percentage of religious people, high percentage of you know don't cuss people, church going people. But you can also usually walk around with a gun there. So the square I, states are cool, right? They're not square, but they live in one of the square states, and they have a 
like a speakeasy and their podcast is recorded after hours at their speakeasy. Like, you, and they're both on the stage talking through the PA, nice with a, softly with a little bit of reverb on. And you can hear like <laughs> the waitress bringing them drinks and stuff. Right. So it's like the after party. It really it's like is. You get in on the after party and get to shoot the. Sh- Most podcasts, when I hear them, if I like them, I write them and give them tips on audio to make it better. I'm not going to do that with these guys because it's not great audio, but it's like. You close your eyes, you're in this f***ing after-hours bar with these old anarchists telling you how it is over the PA with a little bit of reverb. Right, right. It's awesome. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're there, which makes you feel more engaged in the conversation. I haven't heard it yet. I'm just listening to you and pondering what it would be like. I'm going to have to listen to that. I did listen to Bad Quaker. Yeah, he was pretty great. Uh, Although I didn't hear – the episode I heard, he didn't have his uh, co-host with him. I guess it was Kai. I don't remember the name. He was lamenting her not being there and saying that it's better when she's there. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't heard an episode with her there. I'd like to also hear that. I just became aware of it today, basically, when you sent me the email. I um, linked him on our site, and I wrote him a long, glowing fan letter, and he wrote back and said, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) That's fine. He doesn't owe me anything, and I'll still pimp him. Yeah, exactly. So, um, open letter to some tax eaters. You want to read this? Yeah. This, let, this email I wrote the other day. Well, for those of you who have uh, been listening to the cast, Michael's been getting these letters. Go ahead and explain to the letters, and then I'll read your letter back. Actually, the letter back kind of explains it. All right. And, All right. Uh, and we've talked about it before. So. Okay. This is from Michael W. Dean. An open letter to some tax eaters. To Michael C-Z-A-J-A, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, and Professor Stuart Cottrell from Colorado State University. Hello, you keep sending my wife letters about some pine beetle survey. First, how did we get on your list? Second, take us off your list and take us off all lists for all future mailings too. We don't want to participate in some tax eater survey. You're feeding at the trough of public taxes. In a truly free world, your job, if it needed to exist at all, would be done by the private sector without stealing the public's money by proxy at the barrel of a gun to my head via voting and taxes. I highly resent you sending me these incredibly dunning letters. These increasingly dunning letters. Well, they're probably incredibly dunning. Yeah, too. they are. Okay. I highly resent these increasingly dunning letters. We never agreed to do this. We have never contacted you. We've never dealt with you. And yet you're acting like a collection agency with your spam snail mail. Where is your survey? Why haven't you filled out your survey? We need your survey. <laughs> like many in the public quote-unquote, education sector, you have no concept of voluntary action. Stop treating us like we owe you something. We don't. If you send us any more demands to fill out and return your surveys, I'm going to start sending both of you and your institution invoices at my normal hourly rate for the accrued time I've spent reading them and throwing them away. (laughs) Michael W. Dean and Deborah Dean from Casper, Wyoming. (laughs) (laughs) That was fun. Yeah, it was a good letter. Thanks. I'm sure there's some provision buried in the Patriot Act where this survey is a matter of national security, so I should await the knock at my door. <laughs> as long as you don't get droned. I think you could probably deal with the knock pretty well. You just don't answer it. I um, I know. I'd call the police and say, there's some <laughs> insisted people knocking at my door. <laughs> They're trying to force me to talk to them about pine beetles. You know, there's actually one instance where I would call the police. It would be if there were somebody outside my house banging on the door claiming to be some kind of police or federal officer, but I don't see a car, a cop car out the window, I would probably call 911 and say, get the cops over here. There's somebody claiming to be a cop outside my house. Because, you know, (laughs) that's a common ruse is to say where the cops let us in. I just wonder what dispatch would do. Do you think they'd treat it with any sort of hesitancy like you were actually supposed to have a cop at your house? Maybe I'd ask them. You know, (laughs) I'd say... But they probably wouldn't know. The dispatcher probably wouldn't know. They'd probably send a car. Right, right. And they could fight it out. Right. I looked up this professor, Cottrell. I'm wondering if this is the guy whose daughter I used to date. I used to date a girl who had that last name who lives in Colorado. Huh. Or niece or something. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. (laughs) But um, I looked this guy up, and he actually, he has a class that's a three-credit class that he has every year where you go to the Bahamas and sail. Wow. And I'm like, nice tax eater job. <laughs> Seriously. Stuart Cottrell. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, and I looked him up online, and everyone's like, "He's the greatest professor ever. He took us to the Bahamas." You know, <laughs> it's not, it wasn't his money. Well, I guess it was his money, but he didn't earn it. He got it through the taxpayers. The students might have to pay for theirs, but I'm sure he doesn't pay for his. But exactly. maybe the students don't have to pay either. But to his credit, he wrote me back today and said, "Apologies for the inconvenience." Uh, ah. your, na- your name has been taken off the list as per your request. Kind okay. regards, Stuart Cottrell. Okay. okay. And I like that the professor wrote me back. He didn't met it out to the grad student, Michael, what's his name? Unless it's just a form letter that he sends every time he gets complaints. <laughs> yeah, that, that senses indignation and, and the word <laughs> right. pine beetle and just yeah. sends this auto reply because yeah. he gets so many of them. Yeah, he's just got to click one button on his computer. I, I have a feeling he's, he hasn't gotten any of them. I mean, look how long it took me to sit to actually go, okay, this is never going to stop. I need to do something. I don't know. There's probably some environmental nannies somewhere that need something done about the pine beetle and have sent back the survey. I, I don't think that's too far fetched. No, I mean, I think most people probably fill it out because it's from. Has government words on oh, you don't, it. You don't think many people take the time to write him a letter. Right, right. <laughs> Damning him. Damning him and his survey. Throw it away. Yeah, you know? yeah. And one of my friends, uh, I posted this on the Freedom Fiends forum, which you should all go check out. Yeah, Freedom it's Fiends. dope. It's dope. Um, there's a link on the Freedom Fiends site. It's a friendly little place for Freedom Fiends and friends and fans. Yeah. Good place to go and, you know, kick back and relax and just shoot the crap. Yeah. But uh, my friend saw this letter and said he'll read it and see the word Wyoming and go, of course. (laughs) That makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Although, I mean, parts of Wyoming, especially like Cheyenne, I call it North Denver pretty much, you know. It's got some of that liberal Colorado type feel to it. Yeah. Since time began, tyrants have taken aim at personal liberties. Now there's a movie that aims back. The government has no more right to tell us what to put in our bodies than they have to take our guns or tell us what books we can read. Six drug police were eaten by bears while raiding a marijuana farm. On your knees, you dirty hippies! Jesus. On your knees! What's the problem, officer? Today, many cops who enforce pot laws do so only because it provides them with cushy jobs, good benefits, and a chance to push people around. I was an undercover narcotics officer. The drug war is nothing but a farce. The Second Amendment says you gotta keep you and your gat intact. Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom. A film by Michael W. Dean and Nima Vidati. DVD available now at gunsandweed.com or on Amazon. That's gunsandweed.com. Makes the perfect gift. Remember, that's gunsandweed.com. What does freedom mean? Tune in to LRN.FM to find out. LRN.FM is the Liberty Radio Network, a collection of live talk radio and podcasts, all coming from a principled pro-liberty perspective. LRN.FM show hosts aren't left, right, or conspiracy kooks. You can tune in 24-7 to LRN.FM via your phone, computer, satellite, and more. Listen free anytime at LRN.FM. That's LRN.FM. And now, some corporate whoring for one of our favorite products. Hi, I'm Nima Vidati from the Freedom Fiends Podcast, and I'm excited about Vaporsmith's electronic cigarettes. I dig the taste, and I dig the freedom to vape anywhere the nanny staters would wet their pants if I smoked. Howdy, I'm Michael Dean of the Freedom Fiends, and I love Vaporsmith's. I smoked three packs of tobacco cigarettes a day for decades, but now I'm only using Vaporsmith's. I love the flavors, I don't smell like smoke, and I save money, so I have more to spend on ammo and treats for my kitties. Vaporsmith's e-cigs revolutionize nicotine ingestion by bringing it into the 21st century. With Vaporsmith's, you'll enjoy all the invigorating nicotine with none of the nasty smoke. Vaporsmith's are clean, efficient, and tasty. Available in three strengths and eight delicious flavors. Reds, Classics, Turkish, Menthol, Strawberry, Cherry, Vanilla, and Cloves. Go to Vaporsmiths.com for a free starter kit, a $39.95 value. With the purchase of 40 cartomizers or more by using coupon code FREEDOMFIEND. This is a limited time offer. Vaporsmiths.com is run by a liberty-loving entrepreneur, not some subsidized tax eater conglomerate. Vaporsmiths at Vaporsmiths.com Vaporsmiths, 
I'm enjoying one right now. Did you see this headline? Facebook aims to help prevent suicide. <laughs> How do they aim to do that? Are they going to like self police and you know put restrictions on what you can post? They're going to use horizontal enforcement. They're going to let people see something, say something, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be like you know normally if you go to block somebody or report them, there's a drop down menu of like you know this is copyrighted content, this is hate speech, this is violent speech, or just this person's bugging me or this person's pretending to be me or whatever. They're going to add... And now there's one, a new menu item. This person might off themselves. Yeah, and when Facebook gets that, they're going to have the suicide hotline contact that person. Huh. That's going to be annoying. I'm waiting to see how long before you can have someone committed via Facebook. I mean, I just it's days away, probably. Right, right. Um, it's important to point out that, you know, there's a whole mental health industrial complex, too. Yeah. Uh, and the state enforcing things like mental illness when, um, you know, as Stefan Molyneux puts it, it's really the society that's sick. It's not necessarily individuals. And when this is, when you're against the horizontal enforcement or the things that everybody thinks they're saying, um, you know, they can do something like, say you have oppositional defiant disorder. <laughs> should I insert the uh, ad for compliance that we made? I think we should. It's been a I while. Think you we, should. Have, <laughs> we have new listeners. Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? You don't make waves, so why should they? Studies show that 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. ODD is a real problem in our society, according to the DSM, the big book that lets psychiatrists know who's mentally ill and who's not. ODD is also known as Libertitis, or Inflammation of the Liberty. It's been a serious problem for almost 50 years. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. In severe cases, kids may be suspended from school and end up in jail for violating those all-important nanny laws. In extreme cases, they might even quote Ron Paul. <gasps> but now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Compliacin reduces non-essential brain activity by 70%. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. This drug can even keep your kids off drugs. Unlike outdated methods such as punishment or uniforms, Compliacin works on the inside, taking choice completely out of the equation. Compliacin combines Thorazine, Ritalin, and 15 secret herbs and spices. It has all the effectiveness of a chemical straitjacket with none of the drooling. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Compliacin. From Pilfer. Pilfer. We've got a pill for everything. <laughs> so that was our ad for, uh, yeah, I mean, basically it's like they want to keep kids off drugs so they can give them the government sanctioned drugs, which are worse. Right, right. They are like the mafia. They, they want to have the, the whole thing on lock. You know, they don't want anybody else on the block pushing up, trying to slang stuff. You know, you, you had a nice Freudian slip before the commercial. You said, um, government wants to enforce mental illness. <laughs> government is mental illness. It's the opposite. They, all, they always say that, you know, anarchists are people who go against this kind of authority. They have a problem and they're the ones who are sick. But really, I think it's the government. People who believe that using force to solve social problems, those kind of people I think are sick. You know, there's, there are a bunch of uh, unintended consequences of people seeking help if they feel depressed. You could lose your gun rights. You could get institutionalized when there's no need for you to be. Right, All right. sorts of things. You know, your insurance could go up. I mean, with the so-called Obamacare, there's a lot of provisions of, like, reporting and sharing information among agencies, too. Right, right. 
complete lack of privacy. They want to know everything about us. Yeah. It's, it's just they, what they own us. Do. They think they own us. Yeah. They think we're tax livestock, and they want to yeah. they want to keep the herd just healthy enough to keep paying the money. So speaking of that, California Governor Jerry Brown this week signed a handgun open carry ban. Really? Yep. Ah, uh, he's banned carrying an unloaded gun openly in California. In the whole state? Yep. That's insane. You know, I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, at the beginning of the cast, I said, you know, I was thinking about LibPair. This is another thing I was thinking about LibPair. It's, like, really cold right now. I'm wearing gloves, and I've got, like, layers over, and I'm carrying concealed. You know, if there was a threat, I'd have to take my glove off, dig through all this stuff. I think open carrying is just so much better to actually, if you if you ever had to use a gun, wouldn't you rather be openly carrying it than concealed? Cops don't conceal carry exactly. unless they're under cover cops don't conceal carry i think in lip pair you would proudly display your guns yeah. most most people would and i think it'd be a fashion thing too i think people would have like chromed out you know pimp in cup <laughs> type holsters and they'd look you know dope and uh you know people would uh have designer holsters and i think i think everybody would wear a rifle you'd look like anime characters or something you'd have the glocks by dre glocks by dre Holster. <laughs> yes you would you would well you know in there's a couple countries where citizens openly carry to and from their military training, which is right. kind of cool, but it's kind of sucks because it's like everyone's conscripted. Right, right. Switzerland is one and Israel is another. You know, there's this great picture I've seen around of Israel of these three girls that look 16. They're probably 18. But they're doing their mandatory military service, and so they're walking around with their rifles. Yeah, they're like getting mm -hmm. ice cream in an ice cream parlor, and they're all dressed really like cutesy girly at an ice cream parlor with these, you know, galils on their shoulder, which are uh, AK-47s yeah, yeah. chambered in 223. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be cool. I don't know. I think I think Libpair would probably eventually progress to the point where, you know, people didn't feel the need or you just have one sidearm or something like that or a revolver on your foot or thigh. A lot of times people argue and say it's a straw man argument when libertarians say we need to keep our guns to keep another Hitler from happening. But the fact that there are 16-year-old girls walking around in Israel with guns on their back is because of Hitler when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like never again. And unfortunately, right. it's through the state instead of through private ownership. But The other know. thing that, that I just thought of is, you know, when people compare people to tax cattle and, you know, we're, we're the government livestock. I mean, people herd cattle. They herd cows. They don't herd lions. If, yeah. if you're armed, you're a lion. You're not going to get herded. There you go. I like that. Speaking of the Internet and armies, this is pretty funny. Kenyan army and Somalia military swap Twitter <laughs> insults. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> I, it had to happen, you know, and, yeah, and, yeah. It, and it, I guess it happened. I mean, those aren't libertarian countries, but they're countries without as much government as we have. I mean, Kenya has probably a horrible dictatorship, but it's it's still kind of a rough and ready country where someone could do this. I mean, I don't think American soldiers could get away with this. <laughs> right, you know? right. The right. government can get away with hacking Iran. But, uh, you know, soldiers couldn't get away with insulting this, the, the other side. American soldiers probably aren't allowed to tweet. I mean, you know, American police officers aren't allowed to talk to the media. They wouldn't be allowed to tweet. I doubt soldiers would be. And I thought it was just hilarious that these two, I, I mean, it doesn't sound like they're, I guess one of them was a major general. The other one must be some PR person for Al-Shabaab. And he was just totally ragging on this guy. And to me, it was hilarious because like in video games, like in strategy games, you know, whenever you, your army is meet and fight uh, or even in movies you know the, the leaders will, will talk sh to each other and that never happens in real life or at least with you know big governments because they're, they're not going to talk to each other but it's just these these dudes you know it's like dudes bowing up to each other in a parking lot or something it's grade school between yeah. armies you right know? yeah yeah yep yes so um did you look up this guy john beard yeah, I did. He's the newscaster on um, Arrested Development, right? And he, he was an actual real newscaster. Yeah. You know, they show, like, 
He's on there a lot. He's supposed to be the Fox News local guy in L.A. And I think he actually was at one point. And then they show him, like, in archive footage. It's supposed to be archive footage from the 70s. And it's like, you know, him with a wig on trying to look younger. It's pretty funny. Right, but he's right. in a lot of episodes. He's on TV trying to, you know, like, he's often reporting on the Bluth family. He had an interesting... He, he basically quit some killer media TV anchor jobs because they weren't letting him tell the real story. Like yeah. you did. Yeah, just like I did. Uh, of course, he was in a place like L.A., wasn't it? I mean, he was in, like, the top market. Like, he was probably getting paid, you know, fat bucks, you know, boosted the ratings of the place. And he just was sick of talking about celebrities or fluffy stuff or boilerplate stuff. And he wanted to report real news. So yeah. he chunked the deuce. He had an interesting thing in his background when before he went to L.A. when he's in Buffalo, where he's from. He was doing a live newscast, and somebody stormed the station with a handgun and demanded to read some statement on the air, and they let the guy read the statement on the air. And when the guy set his gun down, John Beard grabbed it. That's <laughs> well, awesome. Yeah, the wiki leaves you hanging there, though. And I briefly searched to see if I could find a news archive about it. I couldn't. I'm sure it's there somewhere on the interwebs. But do you have any idea what happened after he grabbed it? I mean, did the guy just get escorted away by security? He's like, wait, my gun. I would assume. <laughs> That's how it ha would happen in a movie. You know? Yeah, yeah. Unless in a movie, maybe the newscaster would shoot him. I, I wonder if John Beard kept the gun. <laughs> <laughs> Has it framed in his office. Yeah, one thing he didn't do, he didn't field strip it and hand it back to the guy. Yeah, and say, so here, <laughs> let me make sure that works for right, you. Right, here you go. <laughs> Point it back at me again. Another weird connection with um, Arrested Development. I noticed... I don't know if we talked about this before, but I've been watching it again, like the fourth time through all of them. It's driving DJ crazy. I think I think I've been through the whole series four times, but it's been stretched out over. Yeah, it's been stretched out over since when it came out, though. <laughs> You've seen it four times within a few months. You don't have as much free time as I do to sit and watch twenty hours of it in a row. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Although I'm working on our media empire while I'm doing that, but exactly. Uh, but there's a song in there that's used in the episode, the one where. The reenacting the famous painting. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. There's a song that comes up two or three times in an episode. It's "Cry Love" by John Hyatt. It go, it's got mandolin. It's kind of folky, but with a good beat. And it goes like, "A moment of steel, a dry hot house. Did you say goodbye to him, or did he kick you out? Cry love, cry love. The tears of an angel, the tears of a dove." It's a really good song. Sounds huh. kind of cheesy, but it's a really good song. Yeah, I don't remember it at all. I'll have to go back and check for that. The drummer on that is Michael Urbano, who played in my band Slish. Oh, sweet. And the mandolin player on that is David Immergluck, who played guitar in my band Slish, who is the guy who came up with the phrase, worms. Worms. <laughs> so there's a... The mandolin in Arrested Development has a worms connection. Is basically what that boils down to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the mandolin's a pretty dope instrument. I don't mind listening to it. It's it sounds yeah, good. I like it. I like I like bluegrass every now and then. You know, uh, some mandolins and some fiddles. It's good stuff. Good. So speaking of Arrested Development, Jessica Walter, who plays the mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, she's great. She's who's so great. also in Archer, the animated show. She basically plays the same character in Archer as the mother in Arrested Development. Yeah, a yeah. controlling, passive aggressive, aggressive aggressive, mean mother, matronly, right. rich matronly, woman yep. who controls the family. Yep, business and the family, and makes all the all the men in the family feel <laughs> less than. Yes, um, she's the queen bee. Yeah. yeah, I saw a movie from 1971 that she's in where she plays a, a character that makes her character in Arrested Development and Archer look peaceful and together. <laughs> wow, that's quite a feat. Yeah, it's called Play Misty for me. It's Clint Eastwood's directorial debut. debut. He stars in it, and he directed it. And Jessica Walter stars as a psycho stalker murderous woman. Yes. You know, that does make sense. I think that she would grow up to be the character in Arrested Development if that was yeah. her past. Yeah. It's a really good movie, and it was one of the first stalker movies. I mean, I guess you could say Sunset Boulevard from the 50s is kind of... It's a crazy woman movie, but she's not really a stalker. She doesn't leave her house. What, what about that Stephen King there where the writer breaks down and gets locked in the cabin? I think that's later. That's called uh, Misery. Let yeah, check Misery. That out. Yeah, you're right. That is later. It is later. But, you know, this movie definitely paved the way for... What's the movie with uh, Glenn Close where she plays the crazy, crazy woman? Fatal Attraction? No. Yeah. yeah. Is that it? Mis okay. Misery, the movie's 1990. 
and the novel is 1987. So this 1971 movie definitely you should everyone should go out and watch this movie. It's great. Awesome. Play Misty for me. It's filmed in Carmel by the Sea, which is where he lived, and he was later the mayor of. And you can tell he loves the town. It's got just stunning footage in every scene. Wait, of, wait. Clint Eastwood was the mayor of something. Oh yeah, <laughs> he was the mayor of Carmel, California. Carmel by the Sea. Huh. Because he ran a restaurant there. I think he still runs it. It's called the Hog's Breath Inn, I think. Yeah. And he didn't like that the city council nannies kept f***ing with his restaurant and making it hard to do business. Wow. So he ran for mayor and won. So he could... That's dope. That reminds me of uh, the Ron Swanson for Governor website. Which is great. Right. Have you linked that? Uh, we should put that in the cast notes for this. No, but we have a thread about it on the Freedom Fiends fun ah, forum. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so you, you like how I did that? I saved myself future work yeah. and drove people to our forum. Good point. Well played, Mr. Dean. Yeah. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. So I have another movie review from the 70s. The 70s were a good era for movies, man. It was kind of the the rise of the director as the auteur, you know, from the French cinema. Like, in France, the director has always been the whole movie. Right. In America, the producer, the actor, and the film studio was king until the 70s. Mm -hmm. And they broke that mold with movies like this and Easy Rider, relatively low-budget kind of art house films that were put out by major studios where they would like just read the script, give the director all the a couple million dollars or a million dollars or a half million dollars back then and leave him the f alone. Yeah. Which yeah. they haven't done before or since, but the 70s, right. there was a lot of that. Midnight Cowboy, there were just a lot of movies that were done that way then. I think a lot of it was the influence of the spaghetti westerns that Clint Eastwood was in. He was in these Italian-made movies that were supposed to take place in America and Mexico that were directed by powerful indie directors that controlled everything. And that kind of spilled over into American cinema. Right. Nowadays, you got to get all sorts of approvals and government permission right. slips and have your meeting with the Pentagon and make sure you don't show America in a bad light and all that yeah. good stuff. And people did a lot of movies in the 70s that were about really weird things portrayed in really cool ways that wouldn't happen now. Like now they'd have to try to put a romantic ending and a, a moral and a product placement and a... You know, all the stars have to have high cheekbones, and right. it wasn't like that in the 70s. And another movie that fit all that description that I saw was Paper Chase from 1973 this week. Okay. I saw it. Have you seen it? Mm, nah. It sounds like a hip-hop movie, or an album, or a song. <laughs> Paper Chase. In fact, I think it is a song. It's actually law students at Harvard Law School. Okay, so what kind of paper is they chasing? Grades, and I mean, if, <laughs> I think gay. there's a double entendre of they're, they're all going to be powerful attorneys one day, but right, uh, right. it's you know basically paper. It's like uh -huh. you know looking things up in the library and having the right quote from the right legal paper. It's so much lamer than it sounds, but apparently it's a great movie, so drop some It size. is a great movie, which really <laughs> surprised me. Now, here's the funny thing that you'll relate with. My friend Bo, that I knew since I was 16 and he was 13, uh -huh. is now a Wall Street attorney, a powerful, rich Wall Street attorney. He went to Harvard Business School. He was a legacy. His dad went to Har I mean, Harvard Law School. His dad went to Harvard. When he was going to Harvard, I was out in Boston visiting some chick, and I went over to Cambridge to see Bo at school and had lunch with him. And he took me on a tour of the campus, and he took me into this really cool-looking round classroom, and he kind of looked at me like I was supposed to know what it was, and he's like, you know what this is? I'm like, no, it's a cool-looking classroom. And he's like, it's the classroom from the movie The Paper Chase. Ah, and I said, right. And I said, and I mean, it's in like half the scenes, and like the movie pretty much almost takes place in this classroom. Okay. Which okay. is not, it sounds lame, but it's a great movie. Um, <laughs> and I said, what's Paper Chase? And he looked at me the way everyone looked at you when you said, what's Apocalypse? I've never seen Apocalypse Now. I didn't say now. what's Apocalypse Now. I said I'd never seen it. You did say who's Patty Hearst, but yeah, it was the same thing. So <laughs> I've experienced that before. And it was a younger guy like looking at me like, how can you not know what Paper Chase is, Michael? Uh, so what's good about it? What do you love? Everything that's good about any good movie. Um, okay, okay. Drama, humor, heartache, drive, 
Got it. Got it. It's just a great story told. In the words of Stewie on Family Guy, friends become enemies, enemies become friends, everyone's a little richer for the experience. <laughs> all right, all right. That's DJ and I's joke when we're summing up, like, canned plot points but it is right. it has all that but it does it really well right right paper chase paper Get chase it. so we have a correction from last week the pronunciation of uh, the ira's political arm is Sinn fein Sinn fein what did you say i think we said like three or four different things oh we, i said sean finn and uh, sean fine right. and sean penn yeah sean we, penn. We, we didn't oh, get it. God. <laughs> hey you don't want to piss those people off man uh, right dj's laughing in the other room <laughs> i'm irish my name dean is from odin so that makes sense. I could see you as an Irishman. Yeah, they changed it. <laughs> well, Irish nationalists would say, you should change it back to Odin. Odin? They wouldn't cut me slack for being Irish. They'd say, you should go back to being Odin instead of hiding your past. How does the whole Irish thing work? Are you, like, Irish if your mother's Irish? Is it like being Jewish? No. <laughs> I think it's more like being Cherokee. Like, you know, if you're 164th Irish... Then, then you get to claim it. Right, right. But I'm over half Irish. Okay, so. okay. <laughs> Tyranny in your neck of the woods got you yowling? Tell the Freedom Fiends about it at talkback at freedomfiends.com. So the, the name of today's podcast episode is Beyond the Gun. Beyond the Gun. Will you read this uh, essay, Why the Gun is Civilization, by someone named Marco? Marco, where did we get this from? Uh, it's around. It's been around for years. It okay, goes it's, around. It's like, yeah, it's from a blog. I can link okay, the blog. Okay. But Go ahead. I'll grab Human that. beings only have two ways to deal with one another, reason and force. If you want me to do something for you, you have a choice of either convincing me via argument or forcing me to do your bidding under threat of force. Every human interaction falls into one of those two categories, without exception. Reason or force, that's it. In a truly moral and civilized society, people exclusively interact through persuasion. Force has no place as a valid method of social interaction. And the only thing that removes force from the menu is the personal firearm, as paradoxical as it may sound to some. When I carry a gun, you cannot deal with me by force. You have to use reason and try to persuade me because I have a way to negate your threat or employment of force. The gun is the only personal weapon that puts a 100-pound woman on equal footing with a 220-pound mugger, a 75-year-old retiree on equal footing with a 19-year-old gangbanger, and a single gay guy on equal footing with a carload of drunk guys with baseball bats. The gun removes the disparity in physical strength, size, or numbers between a potential attacker and a defender. There are plenty of people who consider the gun as a source of bad force equations. These are the people who think that we'd be more civilized if all guns were removed from society, because a firearm makes it easier for a mugger to do his job. That, of course, is only true if the mugger's potential victims are mostly disarmed, either by choice choice or by legislative fiat. It has no validity when most of a mugger's potential marks are armed. People who argue for the banning of arms ask for automatic rule by the young, the strong, and the many. And that's the exact opposite of a civilized society. A mugger, even an armed one, can only make a successful living in society where the state has granted him a force monopoly. Then there's the argument that the gun makes confrontations lethal that otherwise would only result in injury. This argument is fallacious in several ways. Without guns involved, confrontations are won by the physically superior party inflicting overwhelming injury on the losers. People who think that fists, bats, sticks, or stones don't constitute lethal force watch too much TV where people take beatings and come out of it with a bloody lip at worst. The fact that the gun makes lethal force easier works solely in favor of the weaker defender, not the stronger attacker. If both are armed, the field is level. The gun is the only weapon that's as lethal in the hands of an octogenarian as it is in the hands of a weightlifter. It simply wouldn't work as well as a force equalizer if it wasn't both lethal and easily employable. When I carry a gun, of course, this is Marco speaking, he doesn't do so because he's looking for a fight, but because he's looking to be left alone. 
The gun at my side means that I cannot be forced, only persuaded. I don't carry it because I'm afraid, but because it enables me to be unafraid. It doesn't limit the actions of those who would interact with me through reason, only the action of those who would do so by force. It removes force from the equation, and that's why carrying a gun is a civilized act. But now that we've all got them, what now? Beyond the gun, Michael. Beyond the gun. What do you think of that essay, Nima? I think it's a great essay. I mean, I've I've come across, you know, most of those ideas before, but of course it's it's said very well, and I think it really hits the point that it's fallacious to think that guns are not proper or that guns are violent because it's civilized to carry a gun in the fact that you're defending yourself from violent force. So in essence, you're preventing violence from happening by carrying a gun. Yep. An armed society is a society where there's not a class difference between predators and prey. The predator being the mugger, the prey being an unarmed person in society. If we all are on equal footing, then we're going to treat each other. We're more likely to use the golden rule if we're all on the same footing golden rule i like that i mean that that pretty much dj's doing dishes um she's doing dishes i'm sipping on this uh bud light clamato enchilada Ugh, clamato Clamato. there used to be big billboards for that in la and it just used to make me want to vomit i like clams i like tomatoes i like beer and all three are combined it's delicious a weird man (laughs) I don't know. I was in Mexican neighborhoods. Maybe I'm just too white to... It really is, and they jack up the price. I go to this corner store around the way from me, and you know I live in this low-income housing apartment building, so they sort of cater to the Hispanic population. They double charge... Not double charge, but it's three twenty nine for this 24-ounce bottle of... It's called Chilada. It's Clamato beer and, and lime and salt. Three twenty five regular beer there the same size one ninety nine I don't know man maybe I'm just too too Irish in my blood to want to put cephalopod you want to have potato beer you want little chopped up potatoes all up in your Guinness hey hey hey, hey. <laughs> so yes so, beyond the gun yes, beyond the gun talk about it I mean some of the notes I had for this we've already covered was the Ron Paul thing the uh, you can't fight them you can't join them you got to just ignore them. Until they go away. Right. The gun is the prerequisite. You know, college starts after the gun. There you go. <laughs> I, I guess why I wanted to call this Beyond the Gun was a lot of media that I consume, a lot of forums, a lot of podcasts, a lot of websites, it's all about the gun. You know, it's like guns, guns, yeah. guns, 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 guns. I get kind of <laughs> sick of it. You know, right. The guns are fun, though. Don't get us wrong. I mean, it's like, right. There's always something to learn. Right. And when Paul Bonneau, you know, blogged about us, he said sometimes he just wants to hear people talking about what caliber they use. I like that, too. You know, that's that's a different side of the same coin is like there's a lot of people I, I know who who talk a lot of theory and don't talk guns or don't have guns. But most of my friends have guns and carry guns. Most of my friends carry a handgun and have a rifle. So... Right, right. Well, it's one class in the University of Liberty. And, you know, you don't want to just study for one class or only go to one class. I think the world and life, you should really explore all your options. Explore the whole gamut of the ideas of freedom. And and guns are certainly an important piece of the puzzle. But um, there's a lot, lot more. I actually had a friend who said that his preacher, I don't know what church he belonged to, but it was a Christian church because they were talking New Testament quotes. His preacher said that carrying a gun is is sinful because it's not trusting God to take care of you and it, you don't mm. own the body to defend it. And I just thought mm. that is about the most insane thing I've ever heard. And I know a lot of Christians that carry guns. And this preacher was quoting the turn the other cheek thing to him. And right. I'm no Christian theologian, but from Christians I've talked to who are, who carry guns, that doesn't mean let someone destroy you. The quote that a lot of Christians who carry guns quote is the one Luke twenty two thirty six, which is uh, sell your coat to buy a sword if you don't have a sword. And the explanation of that is in those days, you know, among the people Jesus was saying that to, they didn't have a lot of money and a coat was very expensive. It was often your only possession. And to sell your coat, you could freeze to death on the desert at night. But he's saying that it's so important if you're going out into the other towns to preach to protect against 
the beasts you're going to cross on the desert and then bad people in the cities to sell your coat to buy a sword if you don't have one. He's, it's basically right. saying defend yourself. Have yeah. you know? I think that those two taken together, turn the other cheek and sell your coat to buy a sword, what I get out of that is uh, if you're walking down the street and someone calls you an asshole, you don't stop and fight with him. You turn the other cheek. You keep going. You don't start fights over little things. You don't hold grudges. You don't uh, try to destroy someone for petty things. So if someone calls you an asshole, you keep walking. If someone calls you right. an asshole and starts swinging a baseball bat at your head, you pull out your gun and shoot him. That's what I think it right. means. Right. I think it means that too. I think that also speaks to the point you made about self-ownership, which was what else the pastor said was, it's not your body to defend. I think, you know, I'm no theologian either, but I think that the whole point or part of the whole point is that you do own yourself because you have that free will. You know, unless you're a Calvinist, then the whole point is you have to accept Jesus Christ yourself. You have the choice of if you go to hell or heaven. God gave you that. That's part of your gift and it's up to you what you do with it. That seems to me inherent in the philosophy as well. Whereas I'm a deist and I believe that there is a creator, but it doesn't do much on a day-to-day -day basis and it doesn't intervene in a supernatural way. But I could still talk to Christians and... But that in that case too, you own your body yeah, though. Definitely. If that's the case, then you definitely own your body. I don't think in any case an argument could be made that you don't have that free agency, that you are not your own unique thing. What do you think about religions... Like, for instance, in Judaism, you're not supposed to get a tattoo because it's destroying God's property. What do you think of that? What do you think of that man who has... I don't know. I'm Middle Eastern writing on your arm in a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a tattoo. I think it's the same way. I mean, I think God gave you life. Part of your life is your body. Um, now, maybe it displeases God to mutilate your body in some way. I don't know. I mean, I'm not God. I don't think anybody can know that. But regardless of whether or not God thinks it's wrong or right, he gave you the right to do it. He's not going to smite you because you did it. He's going to write that down as a note kind of thing. I used to have a Jewish friend who uh, basically as an act of rebellion against his father got a tattoo that was the Jewish word kosher on his <laughs> arm. Because it's unkosher to do that? That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. So more beyond the gun. More beyond the gun. To the gun and beyond. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I like your thing of the gun is the first year of college and everything we're talking about is grad school. You know, get your gun, learn how to use it, be good with it, learn more from time to time, but it doesn't have to be the, it's not the end is what we're saying. Right, right. I mean, for both me and you, the thing we do now is is art. We create. And I, I don't think art is necessarily just things like podcasts or blogging. I think it's anything productive you create in the world. You know, if you control it and you create it. Um, guns are great because, you know, they give you the freedom to do that. They give you the freedom to be productive in the world without having your productive content taken by force. And unfortunately, we do live in a society where the government has more guns than us. Like the bad Quaker said, there's really no point in standing up to attack the government, but you need to defend yourself so that you can be a productive member of society. I did a blog post that I'll link that uh, David Kudria from War on Guns also reblogged today. It's called Free Speech Kit, Including Gun. <laughs> and it's basically combining the gun and art in a portable form. You know, I had two offerings for the kit. One is the, the small one, which is for uh, the elderly, the infirm, and children, <laughs> which is just basically a handgun, an H2 that you can do a podcast with, and a little camera in a little carrying case. And then there's the advanced one for real men and real women, <laughs> which is a, a um, high-def camera, a good external microphone, a little hard drive with some software, a little portable laptop computer and a rifle with some loaded mags <laughs> in a guitar case. Right, right. <laughs> I used to do something similar. I mean, I used to walk around with a $10,000 camera and uh, and a gun on my hip 
or in the news jeep with my tripod. I always had my. I don't know if, if it was my free speech kit since I was working for the media. It was not, <laughs> and it wasn't even your camera. So right, it was the king's, it was the king's camera. camera. It right, was the king's. It was the king's speech. Yes, kit. exactly. And the king's man didn't like you carrying the gun and told you so. Talk about that. Yeah, I think we've we've I've told that story once before in the cast, but um, there was some call. We got a tip that there was you know a heavy police presence in this one neighborhood, and they were surrounding this house, and I didn't know what was going on. So um, you know, I carried. Carried. I carried openly. I went out to the scene. I had my camera. This was during the 10 o'clock. So the idea was to do a phoner. And the people on the scene knew you were a reporter. You know, you had a big camera with the, big, the yeah. news company's name big on it. Big shoulder mounted and camera. They, and they'd met you before, yeah, right? Well, some of, I think one of them had. I, I talked to one of them. And they'd probably seen me around town. Um, came out. <laughs> Dude told me to put... I mean, I'm glad they didn't point their guns at me. But they... Well, dude, dude isn't just cop. Dude is the sheriff of this county. Told you? <laughs> no, he wasn't. He wasn't there that night. He got the report from his boys oh, in the morning. I thought it was the no, sheriff. It was the a sheriff. sheriff called my boss the next morning. But when uh. I first hopped out, one of the deputies came up to me. Uh, he was pretty threatened by the fact that I was armed. Told me to stay back. They just all mean mugged me the whole time. It could have been a lot worse. You know, if I was in California, I probably could have gotten shot. You'd probably still be in jail. You would still, be in, still be in jail. I mean, in California. Carrying a loaded gun, concealed or not, is like a year in prison, plus whatever they can throw on you for disturbing the peace or resisting arrest. Right, right. So even when it was open carry back in the day in California, it couldn't be loaded? That's correct. Wow. And yeah, I should have clarified that when I said that the governor banned open carry without a bullet in the gun today. Open carry, as I see it, as I do it, is carrying a loaded gun on your hip in plain view. Now, what a lot of California activists did was they figured, I guess a loophole is what the you know nanny staters would call it, a loophole in the law to where you could carry an unloaded gun on one hip and a loaded magazine on the other hip if they were both visible. And the idea is if someone aggresses on you, you quickly load your gun and <laughs> cock it. But, you know, there probably wouldn't be time for that. But I'd give an A for effort for trying. Yeah. But... Because 30 people did that sporadically over the past year in California and it made the news, the legislature and the governor had to act to outlaw it before. Well, right, right. <laughs> someone, Won't you please do uh, something some, before for someone the children? Act, you know, it's literally, I mean, they're literally, those people were literally exercising the Second Amendment. And barely, because they were being infringed because they were voluntarily having it not right, loaded. But right. you know, And again, it's really, when I think of open carry and concealed carry like we were talking about earlier, it's really horizontal enforcement that keeps a lot of people from open carrying. Just not necessarily the looks you get at people, but the fact that in, in a lot of places, it does scare people. And, you know, I don't really think it should. It's funny, though, because we were talking about beyond the gun, but I think we've spent 15 minutes talking about guns. <laughs> I know. And that just goes to prove it's easy for it to happen. And why not? I mean, we're not saying don't talk about guns. We're just saying, like, they're a means to an end. They're not the end. What's the end, Michael? The end is liberty. Yes. The end is living like a free man. So moving on, one of the straw man arguments that you get a lot when people are trying to debunk libertarianism is who would take uh, care of the roads? I hate that and one. That's a pretty easy one to debunk. I mean, give it a nutshell. How would that work in LibPair? Again, I always like to do a disclaimer at the beginning of these discussions that we're not putting forth the definitive answer, and that's the beauty of LibPair, is people much smarter than me could come up with a much better way of roads. Yeah, and my analogy is it'd be like asking somebody, a computer scientist in 1964 when computers were the size of a building and cost millions of dollars and took a team of scientists to program and had about the same processing power that your watch has now. If you ask those computer scientists in 1964, in 2011, how will computers work? I mean, they might have been able to envision the internet and uh, an iPhone, but probably not very clearly. So we don't we know. We don't know, but the and it could be an infinite number of things. It would be whatever worked best for whatever geographical location. And that's the other thing, is it wouldn't be so uniform across such a giant landmass. I mean, the way it stands now, we all pretty much have the same transportation, same type of transportation system everywhere in America. It's all roads that are built with government force. One thing that I think would be a common denominator of why it would work 
is because there are people who own land everywhere who would want to make a little bit of money on everyone that goes through, which would add up to less than we're paying in taxes, but everybody would want to figure out a way to get their tiny slice of it that would add up to a lot over time to where if somebody didn't want you going through here, there'd be somebody two miles away that would have the super cool highway that you'd want to use. And I think a lot of it would work with like, you know, there's a lot of technology that comes up that's used for evil that shouldn't yes. be, that wouldn't have to be in LibPair. Like one thing is fast passes, you know, fast passes on cars, you know, where you buy a, a card if you're a commuter and you go through a toll bridge every day, now they have a fast pass and you can go through the quick lane and it just scans a little magnetic strip on your car as you go through and docks you one credit and you don't have to stop and pull out money and have cash. Well, the and all toll that. road in Denver used- actually it takes a picture of your license plate. You don't even have to yeah. have buy any easy pass or fast pass. <laughs> but a lot of that's used for evil because it's used to track people and control them. In LibPair, that same technology would exist, but it wouldn't be used for evil. I think you'd go to Walmart and pay $5 a month to buy the Travel Anywhere card. Right, you right. Know? It'd be like buying an MP3 on, on right, iTunes. Right. It'd be that and, easy. And I don't even know if... It, it, the, the other answer is it could be something other than roads as we know them. It could be something we haven't... It'd be flying cars, you know? It'd be flying cars that are powered on water. I mean, a lot of technology has been squashed by the oil companies. They don't want... They don't really want solar-powered cars. Well, squashed by the government status quo, too. I mean, roads are a giant public works project. It's a giant way of redistributing wealth and and giving people quote-unquote jobs. I mean, what what happened when the economy tanked? Obama stole a bunch of billions of dollars from people or printed it up and gave it to people to repave roads. And didn't do a very good job with it. Was not efficient. Roads are not necessarily a free market phenomenon. And the thing about LibPair is whatever works best would be the way money was channeled to because it would be the pricing system that decided everything. Whatever the most efficient way to move goods from point A to point B would be what would be invented. You know, a lot of people say, okay, I can even accept that with roads. And, you know, if you didn't want to drive, you wouldn't buy the card at Walmart or whatever, but uh, or you wouldn't pay whoever to do, do it. And part of that makes it sound like it would keep poor people out, but it wouldn't keep poor people out because it wouldn't be very expensive. Neither would education. Education would be like paying your phone bill. And people say, well, but now I don't pay anything for my education. I don't want to pay $30 a month or $60 a month, but it's like you'd have so much more money because the government wouldn't be stealing it. You'd they have... wouldn't be squashing competition. There'd be so many more opportunities to make money that everyone would be richer. There's this false right. idea that there's a limited amount of wealth in the world and you need to take it from the rich people when in fact the rich people create wealth for everyone else. And it's not just the rich people that create wealth. Anybody can create wealth. Any voluntary transaction creates wealth because if it's a voluntary transaction, both parties feel richer from the transaction. Yeah, I mean, we've been selling DVDs this week, you know, now that the DVD's out, and we're making money for us, we're making money for the company that makes the DVDs, that presses them, the UPS truck that delivers them in boxes to that company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're making money for everybody. And we're making money for the people that buy them because it's going to open their minds and they're going to see different ways to do commerce. Right, right. That's a good point. And the other thing is, when you mentioned education, I really liked one of Ron Paul's answers in a debate where he said, you know, education would work like cell phones work. Now, have poor people been excluded from cell phones? I defy you to tell me they have. The poorest people have the nicest smartphones. <laughs> no. I mean, homeless people have cell phones. Right, exactly. When the market is open to something, poor people have some amount of money and people compete for their disposable income. And they will offer things cheaper so that they can get that market. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. I actually saw a cell phone ad about four years ago that I thought was a telling sign of the times. It was, uh, I saw it in California. I don't know if it played anywhere else. It was for a company that had pay-per-use cell phones, like... No contract, like the ones you can buy at 7-Eleven kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, you buy at 7-Eleven and then you buy a card to charge them with more minutes. Um, It was an ad for those and it was the guy in the ad who was getting, you know, saying how great the thing was, was couch surfing. 
In other words, he was homeless, but he was staying in people's homes, friends' homes. Right. He used the phone to find a place to stay at night. Yeah. yeah. And this ad was aimed at that demographic. And I'd never seen that demographic marketed to before, but I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. In Lib Pair, every demographic would be marketed to. Yeah. So a lot of people who are like reluctant to the idea of Lib Pair, of libertarianism, of free market, of non-government intervention, they can wrap their head around the Rhodes argument when you tell them everything. You, but... There's a lot of reluctance to national defense or regional defense of like, that has to be done by a government. I've even heard so-called small government people say, you know, the government should only take care of three things, national defense, interstate highways, and international treaties. I mean, that's, and that's basically almost what the original constitution only did. Except it had the sentence general welfare, which sort of gave them carte blanche to do whatever the hell they wanted. Which is why we're not constitutionalists. Two reasons. One is because it's a contract we didn't sign. Yep. We were born into it, not slavery. And two, because uh, it's got a bunch of crap in it, like general welfare and the ability to write taxes. You know, one of our um, moderators on our Freedom Fiends Fun Forum, Mr. Abstracto. Great name. I love animals. it. Yeah. You know, may or may not be the guy who won our camera in our <laughs> contest, but I don't want to say uh -huh. that because I don't want to out anybody. You know, it's kind of funny. He, um, I had a thread of pictures of my cats on the mm -hmm. board, and somebody posted two pictures of my cats that I'd never seen before. And I was like, is this someone who has the same cats and the same couch and the same uh -huh. lamp? I was like, do you have a camera in my house? <laughs> and he's like, no, I have a camera that used to be in your house. Because before I sent that camera to him, right. I wanted something to be on it. But remember, I couldn't figure out how to turn the um, the viewfinder on, so I couldn't see what I was taking a picture of. I thought it was broken, but it was just turned off. He turned it on once yeah. he got it. So I just walked up to my cats and snapped two pictures and forgot about right, it. Right, right. And he posted them. I was like, nice. wow, right on. So Mr. Abstracto had a great post. It was called Editing the Constitution, which would horrify most constitutionists. But I really liked his editing of the Constitution. It was basically, he stripped it down to... Congress shall make no law. <laughs> right, right, right. I think I might have heard that before, but he also read the preamble, which was great in it. You know, if we were going to have founding documents, I'd have the uh, Declaration of Independence, Congress shall make no law, and then um, what was that thing I came up with? Oh, Hassel Doctrine. Hassel Doctrine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Because, yeah, the Bill of Rights, if you just boil it down to Congress shall make no law, then they're not infringing on anything. Um, and really, there wouldn't be a Congress then, but I kind of like Congress shall make no law. The Constitution is already pretty clear in a lot of things. I mean, I think the word Congress shall make no law infringing on really means that they shouldn't make a law that does anything with regard to guns, you know, as far as the Second Amendment goes. And He's saying to anything. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is the government does it anyway. They do make laws that infringe. So if the thing said Congress shall make no law, <laughs> Congress would probably still make laws. Well, they do anyway. They do. And, and a lot of people who aren't Congress make laws now. You know, the ATF, the EPA, the DEA all basically do things that are making and interpreting laws. Yeah, yeah. They make decisions on, um, they make the real where the rubber meets the road decisions. So they're doing the role of Congress and the judiciary. And the executive. Both without being either. Yeah. I mean, they're being the king, which is immoral as well as unconstitutional and illegal. I mean, this thing just came out. Did you see this thing about the feds maybe laundering money in addition to sneaking guns into uh, into Mexico for the cartels? They may be laundering money for the cartels. Why? Um, what's their motivation, do you think? To try to track the cartels better. So what are, they, are they going on Where's George, the website, and looking where the dollar goes? Yeah, that's a funny <laughs> site. They can do everything that they arrest people for, you know, all the time and do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you try to do stuff like that, like, for instance, surveillance, if you try to do something as simple as videotape them, you can get... Oh, yeah. If I climbed up on a telephone pole and put a camera pointing at my neighbor's house, I'd be breaking some law. But they do that with and without a warrant probably all the time, you know? They basically just do whatever the hell they want is what it boils down yep. to. So back to LibPair and how things beyond the roads would work in LibPair. People often say, you know, well, national defense or, mm, you know, if there weren't the nations, regional right. defense. How would you do that? How would you keep 
the terrorists from building a rocket out of some plumbing and lobbing it over into your neighborhood, like they do, like the Palestinians do into Israel. Is right. Good Funny know. enough, that's like the last resort. That's the line they always, statists always fall back to when they feel the the argument is lost. Uh, I was talking to a guy once, and um, he just said, "You know, hey man, I'm just glad the nukes aren't flying. As long as the nukes aren't flying, I'll be happy. They will be." And there'll be the cartels doing it. I would argue, first of all, that countries don't do a very good job of preventing that. I mean, Palestinians do lob homemade rockets made out of fertilizer and sewage tube into Israel. You know, they don't blow up when they hit. They generally hit something that's, you know, they don't generally do human damage, but they do hit things and they have done human damage. But it's like Israel can't do anything about that. Well, I could also make the argument that having a standing army or a military establishment is more destructive to society than not having one. Well, because it makes people want to do things like that, which is what happens in the Middle East. The reason they're wanting to blow up our buildings is because we're over there. And not only that, but when you have a military establishment, you have things like the draft and forcing people to hold a gun and shoot whoever you tell them to shoot. You know, the war is the health of the state, and we argue up and down all day that the state is the most dangerous thing to individuals. Let's say Libpair was passed overnight, was all the laws removed. I don't, I don't think it can be overnight. You all know, right, I, but let's just say incrementally okay. somehow we got to the point where one region, either like the state of Wyoming or the country of America or even the world, were Libpair. There would still be unbalanced people that would want to launch a rocket into the next county and kill people and would be capable of doing it with things they buy at the hardware store. So mm-hmm. how would you keep that from happening? I mean, they don't keep it from happening now. People do that Ex- kind of exactly. stuff. People make bombs. They get caught later, but there's no way of stopping them. Here's how I think it would work in LibPair. Okay. I think it would be taken care of by Google for free. (laughs) And the reason I say that, okay, Google has the best scientists. They really do. They Mm -hmm. have the best scientists and they have really shaped a lot of the way the world works. Google and Amazon, although I think this would be more of a Google thing. Yeah. Because also they've got Google Earth. They've mapped the entire Earth. And, you right. know, I mean, you can go on Google and look at high-res photos of cities that – that kind of stuff that wasn't even nearly that high-res was classified in the 60s and 70s. And we had – spy satellites doing it and now google does it for free so i think google would have drones that would be defensive only they would have the skynet they would have the reagan star wars sdi strategic defense initiative and i think google would figure out a way to do it for free like they figured out a way to do everything else for free because they want to protect the people they make money off of advertising to (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point. Um, I think people would have a lot of ways. And I really don't think, like you said, that, you know, I don't think there would be an increase in people who want to do crazy things. I think there'd be a decrease. And I think a lot of them would be taken out by Darwinism. I think a lot of people who want to do violent stuff would be killed robbing somebody. That's true, too. Um, You know, I used to tell people, some people would say, you know, well, what would happen? You know, people would just be going crazy. You know, there wouldn't be cops to, to protect us. I think things would be about the same. Maybe slightly better, maybe slightly worse, but you would take off the whole apparatus that is institutionalized force. You would immediately make things more peaceable by that factor. And I think for a little while, things might get worse. And it's kind of, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like you have to break some eggs to make an omelet, which sounds like a really crass way to look at it. You know, some innocent, more innocent people probably would be killed in muggings for a day or or week if guns were legalized across the board and there was universal acceptance of something like Castle Doctrine of where you can shoot the bastard when he tries to take your wallet. You know, I think some people would be opposed to guns at first and wouldn't carry them and all of a sudden a lot of people would who didn't before and there'd be a little bit of that but I have to look at that at a macro point of view from like the way an economist would look, which is the way the government looks at it. They look at like a certain number of people dying from X why, why, whatever is acceptable in our grand scheme of things. I think you'd have to look at it that way. And a lot of libertarian talk is kind of in legalese or in economic theory. I noticed that mm-hmm. when I was watching yep. the paper chase, like the way the professor talked in there. And yeah. he was not a libertarian. He was a lawyer of the state who's great at teaching other lawyers, you know, retired lawyer who's great at crafting new lawyers, minting new lawyers. But the way he talked in his rhetoric of, okay, here's the story, here's the legal case, what would you do? The way he explained everything in there sounds like a lot of stuff I hear on 
some of the more intellectual libertarian podcasts, you know, <laughs> like contract right. law. A lot of it was contract uh-huh. law, which is really kind of the basis of a lot of libertarian theory. Well, I also think that, you know, the reason there are thousands of laws is part of that is it's a jobs program for lawyers. Yeah. You know, there's a whole class of people whose job it is to make sense of the thousands of pieces of paper that have inane laws or laws governing things that should work freely and voluntarily. It's basically a foreign language, yes. legalese is, and if you're in trouble with the law, it's so important to you to have someone to be able to understand that for you that you're willing to pay an interpreter $400 an hour. Right, right. Yeah, the state makes their rules so arbitrary and couched in this thing that's only accessible to the right people so that they can keep a whole class of people down. There's actually a movement called the Plain Language Movement, which is a legal movement to require that all legalese or especially government documents be in plain language that the average person can understand. And, you know, the the... Constitution was written in plain language for its time, and that was one of the things Jefferson said was he mm-hmm. wanted it to be able to be right. understood by anyone, of even course. though he was a lawyer. <laughs> and it's kind of arcane language, so it's kind of hard to understand now. And, you know, lawyers and judges argue over the meaning of, you know, the militia in it. And it's like, yep. you just have to look at what was accepted language at the time and read about it. And, you know, that, that means every man should have a gun. Every woman should have a gun. But the plain language movement, I've seen some gross abuses of non-plain language. One was in England when I went to the post office, which is kind of weird because the post office there has a monopoly on a few other things. Like you go to the post office to pay your phone bill, which is kind of weird. But there was a sign at the post office at the window. I can't remember the exact wording, but the meaning of it was count your money before you leave the counter because you won't be able to dispute the change you got after you leave the counter. <laughs> but it was it was in this mind-blowing, it was this long, hundred-word, run-on sentence uh-huh, uh-huh. of like, please to be noted that during remittance at said portal, blah, blah, blah. It was just, I laughed at it. <laughs> right, right. And then if you don't, you know, have the time to waste reading it and figuring out what the arbitrary rules they put in place are you get screwed and that's sort of the whole point of it i'm smarter than most people and i speak english (laughs) and i read it like three or four times while i was in line and took a picture of it and it was like later i figured out what it meant it was so arcane right right so but back to the original question what do we do do you need a national defense no do you you need a standing army you need google to defend you. you need and they people. would, because they'd want to keep you alive. Right, right. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends Podcast. Available from freedomfiends.com That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com I think there'd also be on a more individual level things to defend yourself. And there's also nothing to stop a group from voluntarily forming to meet a threat. Just like when there's a hurricane and the men of the block or, you know, the the teenagers of the block or whoever it may be goes and picks up all the trash and makes sure the little old ladies have water. There's no need for force to be involved. It's getting to the point now where there's so much government that things like that are difficult. They really are. No, in a way... That sounds, that's common, that reminds me of like what used to be ridiculous. Like, you know how every law firm I've ever been in, or most of them that I've ever been in, I've been in a lot as a bike messenger and had to wait in line for stuff. And, you know, my wife works for a lawyer and I've been in their office and like a lot of them in the lobby have a book as a joke of like weird legal statutes around (laughs) the world. Uh And they always have like, you know, in dumb Minnesota, it is illegal to wear a yellow hat on Sunday. And these are real laws. We've actually, we did a half an episode on this once. Yeah. It's getting to the point where like government business as usual is resembling the things in those books. Like one I heard was in the wildfires in Texas this year, volunteer fire departments were showing up to help the fire, like with their trucks, with their men, with water, like we're here, we're volunteering, you don't Mm -hmm. have to pay us, we'll help from the neighboring counties. And FEMA was turning them away, saying only FEMA firemen are authorized to do this. And there's another common straw man argument against libertarianism that in LibPair, 
people who don't have money to pay the fire department, their houses would burn to the ground, which isn't true. And right now, the federal government is letting people's houses burn to the ground with crap like this thing in Texas. Yeah, yeah. No, FEMA's notorious for that kind of stuff. When my family was in, you know, Hurricane Rita in Houston when it hit, and another more recent one, they said FEMA was just in there gumming up the whole works. They just make a mess of everything. Even on a local level, I remember a couple years ago in New Hampshire, I was reading on the Free State New Hampshire board, they had a particularly cold winter, and the power went out in part of a county for like 10 days. And that's, it's so cold there, you're going to die if you don't have backup. And there were some people that had generators and they kicked on their generator and and they heated their house to keep from freezing to death. And the local sheriff came by and gave them a ticket for noise complaint for (laughs) for running a generator in their backyard. Right, right. Yeah. In LibPair, you get rid of this whole portion of the the society that deems to control the way things work. You have things that work because they're what people want to have happen. Why should you have to wait every few years to vote on a certain person who's going to decide how things happen when you could make that decision instantaneously when the problem arises? And you know, I'm really into the fact that Ron Paul is running for president and getting a lot of press. And, like, I don't know that he could save the country. I don't know that he'll win. I don't know that it's ethical to trust a politician to save the country. But as a philosopher, the fact that that guy is getting national, you know, five or ten minutes of national press in the debates every week or two is really making me happy. Well, the reason I hope he wins is because, you know, they talk about, you know, um, the voice of the public and, you know, a president has a mandate from the voters when he gets into office because he was elected, whatever, yada, yada, yada. But if Ron Paul actually won, that would mean that the American society has really opened up to the ideas of liberty more so than it ever has in its history, except for maybe the revolution. I'm wondering, though, that the way that the Electoral College works, it could be another thing of like the majority votes him in, but the Electoral College doesn't. And when that happened with Bush and who was it? Gore. Um, Who? Al Gore. Oh, I said the whore. Al Ah, Gore. Might as well be. When it happened with Al Gore, it was legitimately legal under U.S. law. It was unless there was, you know, a bunch of tampering with the electronic voting machines, which was also accused. But discounting Mm -hmm. that possibility, and we're going to lead into conspiracies and they're not all true although that one might be but in that election gore did win the popular vote by a tiny percent and bush won the electoral college because of the way things are distributed now my understanding though the electoral college is it isn't just and correct me if i'm wrong it isn't just well these votes are collected so these delegates have to vote this way don't the delegates have a choice of how they vote regardless of what the votes tell them to i believe they do uh, listeners correct us in the comments if we're wrong um if ron paul won an overwhelming majority couldn't the old school gop delegates say this cannot stand and vote it down and say we'd rather have obama and make it happen You know, I would almost hope that that ends up being the outcome because then people will just decide to wipe their hands, hopefully. If there's that big of a momentum and the establishment did something like that, I think that would totally be their death now. That would be us. That would be Liberty winning at that point. No, I don't think so because I think the same thing would happen that happened with the how the Democrats looked at the – You know, I think a lot of people would say, well, we need to fix the system. The system's beyond repair at that point. It, if it were me and I wasn't a libertarian, I, I would yeah. I would see that and say, oh, well, now I know for sure that the system's beyond repair. You know, if, if the delegates just wrote in Newt, Newt Gingrich <laughs> or something. The Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, as Jon Stewart describes it. So I've been watching the debates. I watched the I'll, – I'll link the YouTube video of all Ron Paul's answers in last week's debate. It's amazing, and the guy just keeps getting better and better. He really does. I I think he did definitely knock it out of the park on that debate. And he, he took people to task. And my favorite part was, you know, the last question was, what has somebody else on this stage taught you during this process? Rick Perry's uh, who taught me was Ron Paul because he taught him about the Fed. Mitt Romney learned from Ron Paul about how enthusiastic his supporters were to stand out in the cold everywhere in the state of Iowa. And Ron Paul didn't give a shout out to anyone on the stage. He said but the he people did, have taught me. Right. And he did it so diplomatically that, you know, nobody could really say anything about yeah. it. Well, I'm convinced now that you're right that Ron Paul is an anarchist who just happens to be working in the system. He, if that's he literally possible. used the words government is force. Yeah. 
And he said the key to liberty is nonviolence while talking about what's wrong with government being force. That's, yeah. that's anarchist talk. Yeah. So maybe maybe the ideal situation here for me right now in my mind is that it happens like you said. Ron Paul has such a full head of steam and then he doesn't get the nomination on some technicality or doesn't get the presidency on some technicality. He comes out he's, his hands are clean at that point from the the whole establishment because he's he's not rerunning for Congress. So at that point he can say I am an anarchist Look what just happened. You can't change things within the system. It's too far gone. We need to rethink the whole way humanity as a whole thinks about the way society is organized. I'm also going to link this video, Mainstream Media Admits Ron Paul is Booming. It's an interesting montage of like Fox, CNN, and you know ABC, a bunch of those people saying like, yeah, he's booming and he's out in front. It really was. and um, They all seemed like, I'm sorry I have to report this, but... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, Christiane Amanpour was one of the main anchors in that whole bit, and she's Iranian. I mean, I I can't imagine she's on board with the warmongering against Iran. I don't think I, I think she probably feels like me in that regard, and she doesn't want to see relatives or even distant relatives of hers murdered at the hands of the state because some some people don't know how to read or don't understand the way the world works. Well, the thing is, basically, and this is what a lot of people get wrong: is people are good all over the world, and governments are bad all over the world. Yes, people say like, "I want to bomb all those Iranians are bad. I want to kill them all." No, it's they're not bad; they're victims, man. Right. All over the world, most people are basically good and just want to feed their families and have their kids have a better life than they did. And all over the world, governments are bad and they want to steal money from people and control people and herd them and treat them like tax livestock. That's universal on both regards, that people are mostly good and the governments, I don't even know if I'd say they're mostly bad. I'd say they're completely bad. Christina Alanomapu, what's her name? Christiane Amanpour. Yeah. Um, she is a weenie, though. You got to admit. Yeah, she is. You don't rise to that level of success in the mainstream <laughs> media without, being a, without being a weenie. I really like the character based on her in the movie Three Kings. Have you ever seen Three Kings? Is that supposed to be based on her? I thought that yes. was supposed to be more of a blonde nah, you know, that's Nah, that's supposed to be her. And yeah. you know who's in that movie? Do you remember the Iraqi girl whose like, mother is killed in front of her? And she's yeah. dragged away. She has her arm in a cast. Yep. The little girl. It's a great movie. That girl, that actress, is the girl maybe on Arrested Development. No way. Yeah. Oh, shit. I didn't know yep. that. Yep. Cool. Do the Freedom Fiends make you purr? Tell them so at talkback at freedomfiends.com. So... I want to talk about conspiracy theories that are not true and how common they are. And I want to lead into this by talking about this hilarious Onion News type article we saw called Ron Paul Hands Out LSD to Occupy Wall Street <laughs> Protesters. Uh, yeah, I wish he'd hand me out a joint. That would make my day if Ron Paul just came through and... It was on this site called thedailyrash.com, and it was, it was claiming that Ron Paul had shown up and handed out LSD and encouraged young people to build nuclear weapons at home in their spare time. Right, right. It was great, too. It was, he leaned over and whispered to me, wouldn't you yeah. like to have your own nuke? <laughs> yeah, and he told it, another kid said, yeah, he, told, he gave me some great acid. Me and my girlfriend were tripping on it. Then he came back and told us that if we voted for him, he'd hand out condoms and weapons in high school, in grade school. <laughs> Great school, yeah. 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 Uh, which is just hilarious. Did you have any specific um, conspiracy theories in mind that you believe are, are false that you'd like to call out? Yeah, there was one that you sent to me. It was the one about Mormon preppers. Talk uh, about that one. Uh -huh, uh -huh. What was the story in, uh, in the, the show? It was almost a meme, not just a story, um, that the feds had gone to this uh, Mormon food bank where I guess people can also buy food by bulk, you know, with cash. And the feds were asking them for information on everybody that had bought food there and they said you know we don't keep records of these transactions we don't have it and then the fed supposedly got pissed and then they apparently reported it to the oath keepers you found out or you are under the impression that this is complete false it is completely false and um if you go to that episode of the bad quaker he debunks it but before i read that or heard that I remember you sent it to me and I wrote you back and I was like, do you have any confirmation on this? All I see is a bunch of blogs, Yeah, which uh, we've discussed before. You know, the mainstream media isn't always right and they don't always cover everything that's true and they're often wrong and they're often a mouthpiece for the state and the corporations. But 
when I only see something on blogs and they're like really conspiratorial blogs, I kind of go, okay, I need more information before I'm going to report this as fact. Yeah. And I just had yeah. a feeling about this story. Not that the government wouldn't do that now or one day, but it just didn't ring true to me somehow. And it turns out it's some kind of false flag thing that was fed to the Oath Keepers by somebody, probably to try to discredit the Oath Keepers, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who'd like to do that. Right. And... I pegged it. I just got a vibe off the emanating off the email you sent me or something of like, I need more information on this. And it makes me think a business model that would be really useful if someone wanted to put the time into doing it would be a Snopes.com type site for conspiracy for, stuff. for conspiracies. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah. I mean, it, it only takes a few calls. To fact check something like that. It's like all you have to do is call that Mormon uh, food bank. You or, know? Or, or see if it even exists, pretty much. And stuff just gets reposted all the time because everyone wants to believe that everyone's out to get him and the government's out to destroy everyone. And they often are, but it's like... Another one I saw recently was this woman posted uh, on Facebook. You know, she made this video about Ron Paul, and she said... YouTube is censoring me. Look uh, at this. They're censoring me because it's uh -huh. Ron Paul. And her basis for saying that was that it had like a thousand likes, but only 300 views. She said that they were censoring the number of views. And I wrote her back and I'm like, you know, uh, I have a lot of experience with YouTube and it takes a day for the, yes. the, the stats to update sometimes. It's not in real time. It's yeah. not. And the likes are in real time. So yep. that's the explanation right there. Yeah. The way it works is if you have a video that's getting more than 10,000 hits an hour, the stats update in real time. But it's just not worth it for them to bother if they don't. It right. would just take right. too much processing power. Right, right. If it's a cat doing something cute, then they'll do it in real time. Yeah. If, if, if it's Ron Paul, then they'll wait. Well, if it's Ron Paul going viral, <laughs> they'll do it in real time. But, right, you know, right. this chick's little Why Ron Paul Should Be President video made in iMovie that with, you know, with the webcam on her laptop that, that had no new news that's going to make yeah. it go viral right you know right or she wasn't naked which would make it go viral <laughs> so right anyway i just think people should be cautious about believing everything that comes their way and spreading it well, and part of the thing about some things like that though is i think it says something when things are so believable i mean it is so believable to think that the feds would cross that line i mean yeah. the, the feds Go in and bust up Gibson guitars, for Christ's sake. Right. Well, why would a, a Mormon food bank be any more uh, pristine or unfedable than Gibson guitars? So, we're out of time here, but I have a, one more tyranny today we have to run by, and then, because uh, it's really important and timely, it's important to us. Federal judge in Montana determines that blogger is not a journalist. Ah, so, yes. So, you know, basically it was a woman who... You know, it was demanded that she reveal her source, and she refused and said, I'm covered by shield law, which is in Oregon. A lot of states have it. In Oregon, the shield law says that journalists don't have to reveal their source. And a federal judge in Montana, which is the judge for her district, actually, decided that bloggers are not journalists. Wow. And... This basically says freedom of the press only belongs to a few giant corporations yes. in one way. Mm -hmm. But in another way, it's just a really old viewing of the law. Because in his view, the local paper in Montana or Oregon with a circulation of 300 would be covered by the Shield Law. And the Drudge Report or Huffington Post that have millions of views from the left and the right, let's say two examples, would not be covered. It almost borders on licensing. I mean, I, yeah. I, I shudder to think of, of a society where you had to be licensed to be a journalist. That would be disgusting. A lot of places you do, and um, and I keep getting all of these like suggestions for, like, for some reason on Facebook for North Korea – and Venezuela saying, like, we're the bastions of freedom. Love us. We love free speech. You know? <laughs> it's like a weird... I mean, it's weird because, like, North Korea doesn't even have Facebook. Right. But right. they have a Facebook site. You know, in those countries, for doing what we do, they would shoot you and then bill your family for the bullet. <laughs> bill your family for the bullet and the time it took to shoot you. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. So... Let's have some hope for uh, the future here. What do you got, man? The hope for the future is that children are the future, and they hate the government. Which is the name of next week's cast. All right. Name of next week's cast, yeah. yeah. And if you have anything pertaining to that that you'd like to 
let us know about. Yeah, uh, like good stories about your brothers or sisters or cousins or people you know that are under 18. Or just people that were checking you out at the cash register and you guys had an exchange about how you wish you didn't have to use these Federal Reserve notes. Yep. Anything like that. Anything let us know. Like that. All right, man. Word. Peace. Woo! Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, Dean, from the U.S. Get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I own me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom fans, for fact that I gotta make clear. The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every Friday night, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadati weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them.